I'm going to be talking about why you need to know TMD, even if you're not going to treat it. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield says a lot of these things, intraoral appliances like TR, tongue retaining devices, mandibular advancing, losing weight, all of that stuff they say, but there should be no tr uh, problems with a trial with CPAP. It has to have failed and, or it's contraindicated with the patient. These are all things you know. The device is prescribed by a treating physician and the device is custom fitted by qualified dental personnel. Now, why shouldn't a physician do that? Because they don't know occlusion. We went to school for a long time to learn occlusion and anatomy. They know an anatomy too, but we are the experts. Dentists around the world are the experts in oral anatomy. But they say an absence of temporomandibular dysfunction or periodontal disease for obvious reasons. How are you going to wear a mouthpiece if there's some problems? And I'll go over some of those. A good friend of mine and a great friend of dentistry is Dr. Clifton Simmons. He's uh, the past president two years ago of the Tennessee Dental Association, and he is a plethora of organizations and, and, and articles and textbooks. This guy is brilliant. And I'm just going to quote a few from an article he wrote last year in the Journal of Cranial Mandibular and Sleep Practice titled, Why Are Dentists Not Trained to Screen and Diagnose TMJ in Dental School? And he called up a lot of the dental schools and found out, yeah, they don't have a lot of classes in it. So the ADA refers to the TMD disorders as a group of musculoskeletal and neuromuscular conditions that involve the TM joint and associated masticatory muscles and all associated tissue, which means we're responsible for neck aches, headaches, things I'll go over. These are all things in his article. The definition of dentistry uh, describes that dentistry is defined as the elevation or evaluation, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment, non-surgical, surgical, I could read this here, but there it is for you. And the ADA describes the fact that we are the ones looking for and should be responsible for all of these things, which includes what changes in the mouth can cause that maybe the patient didn't have until you changed their mouth. The ADA House of Delegates approved the dental practice parameters and specify that we have to manage temporal mandibular disorders. Now, manage doesn't mean you have to treat it, but you have to be aware of it. And then if you don't treat it, find someone in your neighborhood who knows how to treat it. Years ago, they used to do a lot of surgery. And they don't hardly do that anymore unless you have a Jay Leno jaw and have to move it back in place. They don't do surgery that much because they started with Teflon. They put Teflon over the condyles thinking that'll make it strong. And on a few of those cases, it's, Teflon was so strong it penetrated the glenoid fossa up into the brain. So they stopped using those types of situations years ago. And dentistry is the only profession that is trained and has skills to differentiate d dental pain from TMD pain. Dr. Janet Travell wasn't a dentist, but she understood that many years ago. The court system in the United States interprets the law to believe that TMDs are within our scope of practice. And myofascial pain is one of the three main categories of conditions seen in TMD. Now, those of you that have been doing pain management, you probably know Dr. Janet Travell's name. I was lucky enough to study uh, under her before she passed away. She was in her 80s in a wheelchair, still teaching. What a wonderful woman. They tried to take her license away. She coined the term trigger point in the 1950s. A trigger point is a hyper irritable spot in any muscle that can routinely always refer pain to a different spot. They tried to take her license away for heresy because nobody heard of that before. Fortunately, there was a very wealthy family in America who had a son with a lot of pain. So she was Jack Kennedy, Senator and then President Kennedy's personal physician. They didn't take her license away. She was pretty, pretty powerful. And what she said was repetitive strained injuries, misuse of the muscle, anything that goes wrong with the muscle can cause a little pooling of, night, of uh, lactic acid, causing a trigger point and referring pain somewhere else. And I remember taking her class and I came home and I had a dental, uh, back when I had, was doing dentistry, I had a guy that said, Doc, I think I need a root canal. This tooth is really, really hurting. 
So I did all of what you do. I did the percussion test, the thermal test, the x-ray, everything looked fine. So I learned what Dr. Trudeau, Trudeau taught me. I felt the masseter, there was a trigger point right here which can refer pain to the ear above the eye and to the maxillary dentition. So with Marquine, just like she did with President Kennedy where his trigger points were, I numbed up his cheek and the tooth pain went away. And all of my dental friends back in, the, in 1980 said, you're crazy. So you can imagine what they thought about her when she had every single muscle in every single part of the body correctly diagnosed with where that trigger point could be. This is back with Dr. Simmons. Based on epidemiological data, uh, data 76% of the population had TMJ signs and symptoms. That's, that's an awful lot. Now, a lot of them go away. You heard other um, authors and, and talkers today say that sometimes uh, there'll be TMJ problems in a third of the oral appliances, but most of them go away down from close to a third down to 8% was mentioned. So this article stated that they estimated that less than 5% of that sample of 76% that had it were being treated for it. And there's a reason for that, because it's misunderstood. And we're in a, a situation where we can understand both OSA and TMD. All dentists who examine living patients should evaluate the patient for all disorders and diseases that are within our scope of practice. That includes TMD. That is the ADA definition of dentistry. And here's what Dr. Simmons says, dentists cannot divorce themselves from this duty. A dentist does not have to treat the patient, but has to know where to look for, find the symptoms, refer it for evaluation, or learn what the symptoms are, how to treat them, and, and treat it himself or herself. Dental schools devote, I love how he ended this one, dental schools devote time as they should to all of the things we need to know, periodontal disease, orthodontics, and implants, everything. Uh, but almost all patients have temporal mandibular joints. I thought that was a cute way of saying it at the end, but uh, I can't imagine how many people don't have a TM joint, but there might be a few, um, probably genetically. So he said there's a paradox. Here's an area of care that the ADA has defined as within our scope of practice, has defined that care through the dental practice parameters, and it requires the skills that aren't being taught in dental school. So if we're responsible for it, and they don't teach us those skills, there's a lot of problems. So this has created an area of care in which many dentists don't have adequate training and skills. These are published words, they're not mine, but I agree with them. Thank you, Clifton. He was, and still is, a great guy. So, here's one. Dr. Canale, prevalence of TMJ disorders in obstructive sleep apnea patients that were referred for OH treatment. He's concluded, the prevalence of pain associated with TMD and the impact of this dysfunctional pain are high in OSA compared to the general population. Well, that makes sense too. Who has more OSA problems? Retronathic mandibles. Well, if you have a retronathic mandible, not like a Jay Leno menu, and you're a little kid and you start wanting to chew a carrot, you get the jaw forward. So repetition, 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 and it creates more problems than if you had a well-balanced mandible to cranium relationship. Early treatment of TMG may prevent chronic pain and disability. Another great study estimated 75%, three quarters of Americans will experience some TMJ symptoms at times, and a lot of them go away. Um, just as we heard today, you make an oral appliance, they start to hurt, most of them, after a while, accommodate, and it goes away. TMD has been called the great imposter. It can mimic many other problems, and that's where the dental schools are having problems, and we're having problems because of that. Maybe I shouldn't touch that because it's going faster than I'm talking. So if they mimic other things, and we're not aware of those things, and we cause those things, there might be a problem there. And what are, what are those problems? Both OSA and TMD are based on anatomy. And if you think of gross anatomy, the physicians know the whole body. Then we, I know about the younger ones, but we had the entire body, I love gross anatomy, and then we had a head. So we are the experts in the oral anatomy. 
and it's been mentioned many times here, we're, we're, we're physicians of the oral cavity. And we're so responsible for the oral cavity. And if we don't know what that oral cavity problems could be, it's important for us to know that. Here's a good example. When I was young, this young, beautiful Sharon Tate actress was murdered by Charles Manson. And I remember looking at her and thinking, gosh, is she beautiful? Is that a shameful thing? Oh, that's too bad. That's how I felt then. Now I look at her, and this was last year, it was an unfortunate anniversary of her uh, Sharon Tate and all the Manson crap. I look at her now and I think, she's got a retronethic mandible. Look at that little pouty lip and she's got a small nose. She might have a breathing problem. I didn't notice that when I was in high school and I didn't notice that when I was a dentist until I, start, until I started getting interested in TMJ problems. Now you talk about anatomy, you know this, I'm just going to show you this. Look at all the muscles, look at all the joints. All of those muscles are within our scope of practice if there's a problem with them, all of them. And we're not taught what the sternocleidomastoid could do, what the trapezius would do, what the anterior digastric could do. If the anterior, anterior digastric is tight because of a TMJ problem, you have dysphagia. So how do you treat that? The anterior digastric attaches on either side of the symphysis to the chin. It loops around, doesn't touch the hyoid bone. It says hello and it grabs onto the lower part of the muscle. And if it's tight, it pulls on it and you have trouble swallowing. So you do a little shot of marcaine here and here and give them something to eat and they can swallow if that's the problem. If that's not the problem, an Indian team might find a, you know, a tumor or something in there. But we are responsible for the muscles of mastication. The next one is a festive scalloped tongue. We've seen that before. We've seen it with other uh, presenters today, too. So this is a person with sleep apnea with no pain. But look at those teeth. There's some grinding going on there. And of course, there's some clenching going on there. And the scalloping in there, just like scalloped potatoes, that's where the, you know, I don't have to explain this. You know that. But we see this with TMJ problems and with sleep. Bruxism with incisal attrition and abfractions at the gingival level. There's another person who grinds their teeth. Does that necessarily mean they have a TMJ problem? No, they have a problem. But you see some oral appliances uh, that could change that and then, and then modify it wrongly. This one shows a person who's really been clenching. Those crowns were because teeth went bad and now they're grinding right through the middle of the crowns. You've seen this. Is it clenching or grinding, and how will this affect an OA for OSA? Now, you can clench, and your partner doesn't hear it. You can grind, and you can snore, and those noises keep them up. But you can clench all night long, have some problems, and nobody knows it, including you. If you don't have uh, TMJ problems, you can grind terribly and still not have a TMJ problem. This lady did. She was a patient of mine. She was dying, from, unfortunately, from cancer. She had oral cancer. Did one operation, it came back, so she's having another operation. So she still wanted to take care of herself. She only had less than a half a year to live. And she's pressing where it hurts. Now that's not where the cancer is. Plus cancer doesn't cause pain, unless it's pressing on something. So she's pressing at the masseter. So I just anesthetized her masseter and made her have a better life for a few months just to keep her, and I showed her how to massage and stretch that and do a little home physical therapy. Here's a little girl that's grinding and grinding and grinding, probably for stress in an area she lives, but if you look at her muscles, they don't look very tight. So just because you clench does not necessarily mean there's gonna be problems with it. But sometimes you'll see, as, as you saw with a few of those previous slides, sometimes there is problems, which makes it confusing. This lady was sent to me um, from the school I graduated from, the University of Detroit. She had extractions, and she dislocated during the extraction. They didn't know what to do with it. So you see that little white stuff under her hair? That's the, I used to use fluomethane now, that's ethyl chloride. You put that on there first, it sort of freezes the area so they don't feel the injection as much. So that was right after the injection. The pain went away, but this is the face of pain. She has shiny skin. She had dark circles under her eyes, her glassy eyes. She's been in pain for two months because they didn't know they dislocated the jaw. She couldn't open, you think they have looked at that. 
So TMD, does it always have pain? No, it doesn't always have pain. Here's a lady that would uh, um, come in to me. She had an accident in Seattle, and they wired her shut. And they wired her shut not the right way. But she has no pain. You would think with this kind of malocclusion, there'd be pain. She has no pain. And so the choice was, do we do orthodontics, we do everything else, or is it just cosmetic? And I don't do orthodontics, so I sent her to an orthodontic, uh, orthodontist I know and made her make that decision. But she came to me because people thought she might have a TMJ problem. She had absolutely no pain, even in the zygomatic fibers of the masseter. Does all trauma cause pain? This looks scary. But I followed up after seeing this picture, and this young boy was, um, being a boy, he's walking a fence and he fell. Well, that fortunately didn't touch anything of importance like his ear, his bone. It just went right through his cheek. And so, does that look bad? Yeah, it looks bad, but you know what? In other countries, they do that on purpose. So trauma doesn't always relate to TMD. I knew if I ever got hit by him, I'd have TMD though, that's for sure. Um, Best fighter in the world ever. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Can that cause TMD? Uh, probably. Now, what we don't learn in dental school, here's a couple ideas. Internal derangements. This one here is anterior disc displacement with reduction. I'm sure you probably can't hear that. The disc comes forward and then it goes back in when, when the cadaver is being moved. So that's anterior disc with reduction. So if you have someone popping and clicking and it goes out, it pops and it pops back in and they have no pain, then we just tell them this is what's causing it and probably no treatment necessary unless there's pain or if they're embarrassed by the click. This can't be fixed that well yet, but it will be. In Germany and Japan, they're doing stem cells to tighten the ligaments that hold the meniscus in place. So I'm, I can't wait till that comes because I have a lot of patients who just dislocate a lot. That can be fixed eventually with stem cells. Is it Heidelberg? Pardon me? Is it University in Heidelberg? I, I think so, but I'm, I don't want to, I'm not going to say for sure. I know it's Germany and Japan. I forgot, I read it and it might be, and Heidelberg's a nice city, I like to go there sometime. This, this one here is a, a different one. It, it's showing the disc that's in place and then it pops out and stays out. It's, you, can, you can see it's staying in front. So this is a displaced anterior disc that stays displaced. And those are the ones that you'll see with people that really have some pain. Uh, it's strange, but on the other one, where it goes out, comes back in. Some people have no pain with that. And this one is degenerative with a large perforation. This one really needs help. And I don't know if stem cells will ever fix that, but that whole disc is, is it's, it's in front and behind the con condyle and it's perforated. And most of those have pain, but some of them don't even have pain, even with that. So do you treat those patients? Well, if you start treating them and then cause them to have pain, that could be a problem too. That's a real gut call right there. So TM joints originally was called Costin syndrome. It's a clinically diagnosed disorder whose common symptoms are, this has been around for 50 years. Well, you know, they're not even teaching cursive in schools in, anymore. So why are they teaching TMJ that way 50 years old? There's a lot, a lot more to it than just what the joint is doing. We're responsible for the muscles of mastication, which go from about the bra strap up in the back and the trapezius. We're responsible, but aren't being taught how to treat everything we're responsible for. TMD is not a disorder that only affects the jaws. It affects all the muscles that posture, how the mandible fits to the cranium. And when these muscles are in spasm, a domino effect happens. And then when you really get to the problem, someone's been in pain for three months, it's almost seriously like PMS. Men and women, at three months, the brain clicks in and says, this is not acute, this is chronic. So it spills out chemicals to help you with that chronic pain. And those chemicals 
are irritability, forgetfulness, things bother you more, and anxiety. I'll list all of them, but they, to me, sound like PMS. And the reason I use that analogy is I was in a car accident, which changed my whole life. I couldn't practice dentistry anymore. That bothered me. I mean, you guys are, you're dentists, and I loved it, but I couldn't bend over. I, I've had herniated discs in my neck and surgery in my spine, two total knees. And I went back to school and became board certified in pain. And, but before I did that, I was still doing a little bit of TMJ stuff, maybe one or two patients a week. And a nice neurologist sends me a patient, spells my name wrong. I mean, he didn't even type it. But I was in pain for over a year. And I sent him the filthiest, nastiest letter, and I don't even swear. How the hell dare you not spell a name right? I went to college two years, uh, for eight years too, what do you think I am, an FNPN with the real word in it? And a couple years later when I got better, and he, took, he told me about it, and I said, David, I wouldn't do that. He says, oh, I know you wouldn't, Richard, but you did. Let's go out. So we went to dinner, he showed me, it was my letterhead, my signature on that real nasty, filthy letter, and I don't remember writing it. That's what chronic pain does to you. And if you're going to deal with pe people like that, or if you're not going to deal with people like that, let's say you've had a patient, they've been really nice to you, for, everybody's nice, There's, they love your office, they love your employees, and all of a sudden they're acting weird or mean, maybe they have something, even if you don't treat it, that you should let their physician know about. Common ear symptoms of TMD, otalgia, ear congestion, ringing of the ear, it's really irritating. Buzzing of the ear, vertigo, hyperacusis, subjective tearing lump, itchy ear. This is a great picture. ENT sends me this lady with chronic ear pain for three years. She was in a car accident. They did a wonderful plastic surgery on her, and she hid that because she had long hair. She was sent to me because she had otalgia. So I felt the zygomatic fibers of the masseter, and I felt like a golf ball in there. I numbed it up with Marcaine. Her three-year, 24-7 otalgia went away in about a minute. Because it wasn't ear pain, she still has an ear. That's just the funnel that was ripped off. The ear pain was caused by the masseter being tight because she had a TMJ problem, which most physicians aren't looking for. So some of the symptoms, the tensor veli palatini muscle constricts on the eustachian tube, and you can get dizzy from a TMJ problem. The anterior malleor ligament traverses the petrotympanic fissure. Now, that's a little tunnel between the ear and the TM joint. It, it attaches to the smallest bone in the human body, the malleus, and it goes through that tunnel and attaches to the TM joint meniscus. So if that meniscus is loose and pulling it and pulling it and pulling it, it pulls on the malleus. And because of that, you can have buzzing of the ear, ear congestion. The sternocleidomastoid muscle, when it's really tight, it torques on the ear, and that could cha change the internal, temp temporarily change the internal anatomy of the ear. So TMJ symptoms cause eye problems and ear problems, and trigger points in the muscles that could confuse where those symptoms are really coming from. And Dr. Travell was brilliant with doing that. She could go like this without touching you, or the microphone, and find out where the trigger point was simply by feeling the difference in the energy flow. Now, I can't do that. I gotta put gloves on and make the patient hurt and ask them how much it hurts and where it hurts. Eye symptoms of TMD. Pain behind the eye, blurred vision, lacrimation, double vision, photophobia. Now, there's one that Dr. Travell didn't know about, retroorbital pain, because Dr. Michelle uh, Dunn and Gary Hack in Baltimore about eight years ago found a new muscle. And it was published in um, Wall Street Journal. A friend of mine brought, brought it in and said, you'd be interested in this. They found a new muscle. And in the Wall Street Journal, which is not meant for humor, it said, how can you find a new muscle? They've been cutting up cadavers since the 1800s. It's like seeing an elephant. Been 20 years in your living room, what, you just notice it? That's not the way the Wall Street Journal usually talks. So I called up, uh, and talk to Dr. Hack, and it attaches to the greater wing of the ethmoid plate of the sphenoid bone and to the mandible. 
So what happens, all the muscle can do is shorten and relax. So when it shortens, the mandible acts as an anchor and it pulls on the little bone behind the eye, causing pain behind the eye. Blurred vision, the way I explain it to my patients, you take a movie projector and you turn the, the uh, lens. Everything's blurry. Or you take a movie projector and, and uh, crack the lens, it's blurry. But on a good lens, you turn it back, no longer is it blurry. So muscles can cause lacrimation, I mean blurred vision. Lacrimation also caused by muscles. Uh, Darwin, we mostly remember him from the Beagle and how he experimented, but he experimented in a lot of things. He hired a photographer to take pictures of 50 children crying. And what he noticed on each and every one of those pictures, the muscles were tight. So if the muscles are tight for other reasons, it opens up the tear duct, causing lacrimation. That's a TMJ symptom. Double vision, photophobia. Photophobia and phonophobia uh, causing by being caused by muscles that either pull on the eye or pull, pull on the eardrum. I first got interested in TMJ problems many, many years ago. I was doing dentistry in the 1970s, and a little eight-year-old girl comes into my office, and on the medical form, she slowly lost her hearing over a year and a half, and her ENT had no idea why. And I looked in there, and I'm thinking, I'm a dentist, so what am I gonna do with the ear? I'm not even paying attention. I just felt sorry for the poor, nice little girl. I noticed her previous dentist extracted a little deciduous tooth, and the upper one, having nothing to occlude with, exfoliated. So I did what any dentist would do. I even the bite out. About three weeks later, they came in. The mother gave me a big cake. The girl ran up and gave me a hug and said, what'd you do? Her hearing came back. I said, I have no idea, but thanks for the cake. And I went to the library. And of course, by the time a medical textbook is published, it's obsolete. Back then, that was really true. But at the same time, I saw Bob Seeger five nights in a row at Pine Knob in Michigan, and I had muffled hearing. Well, they knew that. The tensor tympani pulls on the eardrum. In that little girl's case, that's what happened. The muscle was tight, I even the bite out, the muscle wasn't tight, her hearing came back. You know, pretty simple. They didn't understand it back then. Look at all the muscles around the eye. So if you are looking straight at me and not moving your head and you want to look that way, the lateral oblique might pull your eye that way. If they're all pulling at once, you can get blurred vision. So why? The sphenomandibularis muscle, I told you that one. The masseter, I told you that one. And I explained all that, so I don't want to take up too much time with Dr. Singh coming, I want to hear his. But it's not abnormal for a TBI, traumatic brain injury, to cause obstructive sleep apnea and TMD. Why? Well, when the head hits the windshield, it stops immediately, but the brain continues to move like a Mexican jumping bean. The mandible being the only bone in the body, it's separate, moves, and you can dislocate or sprain the jaw while you're having a TBI. Now, I had no idea what a TBI was. I'm a dentist. I thought TBI was toothbrush instructions. <laughs> and, when, and when I told the speech, speech pathologist I was working with, she thought articulation was how we speak, and we think of articulation differently. We have a different language. So yesterday we heard about Tilly's bucket theory. That really applies when you're talking about TMD, because you might have a silent TMD that's not been a problem for years, and then you put something in their mouth, and maybe it causes something, because just like Dr. Tilly, um, it's called dysautonomia, too. If your body can only take so much, and there's some lumberjacks that you can hit them with a, with a piece of wood four feet long, and they'll just look at you, and the other people, you, you, know, you just scratch them like this, and they'll cry. Everybody is different, and some people can take a lot more. And the problem that we get, that someone else mentioned yesterday, we get the ones who can't take it much. They can't even wear the CPAP. So if they can't wear the CPAP, our little community of what we see is more prone to have these problems. I love this picture because I like dogs, but it also does one thing. If they're all looking one way at one thing, they might be forgetting something that's important the other way. So when you're looking at your patients 
and you're not getting results, there might be something that can help them that you've missed, whether it's with OSA or TMD. Here's one example. Chemicals that relate to both TMD and OSA, they constrict the peripheral blood vessels, that's caffeine, theophylline, and nicotine. So when you constrict the peripheral blood vessels and you have muscle pain, that's gonna cause the pain to get worse. So I have one slide that I'm, I'm proud of. I have physicians that say, I saw that slide years ago and now I remember if they're in a lot of muscle pain, I'll never give them caffeine. This was in my garage. And I was cleaning it out, that's a can of tab that has a lot of caffeine. And I looked at that little muscle, I was ready to throw it away, and I thought, look how tight those muscles are. And it, it's gross, I would not show this to uh, public people that uh, aren't in your position, you understand this. It's a great reminder, that if you have a patient with a lot of chronic muscle pain, and they're drinking a pot of coffee in the morning, that might be all they need, is to get off the caffeine or the nicotine. But try to get a woman off of taking uh, theophylline as in chocolate. Try to tell a woman to stop eating chocolate, I think you'll lose a patient. So, abfractions, caffeine, festive scalloped tongue, chipped teeth, nicotine, theophylline, fatigue. Is that TMD or is that obstructive sleep apnea? Could be both. And this is what we're responsible for. For many symptoms, many for many, symptoms of TMD resolve on their own. And five to 10% of adults suffering from TMD symptoms provide, um, need professional care. Uh, sometimes it's just don't chew so much and put some warm compresses on, but a lot of time th these patients can get through it. And then what I'm typically saying, yeah, I've had this for 20 years, it always went away, and then it got a little worse and it went away, and uh, then it got even worse and then it went away, and now it's not going away. Those are the ones that need treatment. Conventional treatment includes surgery, occlusal adjustments, this is right from the ADA journal, and psychosocial factors. And there's, those of you interested in TMD know there's a big divide between it's only psychosocial or it's all this. Well, I think it could be either or both or a mix. Because if you've been in pain for years, there's gonna be psychosocial problems with that. Um, my wife had spinal surgery this year, and I'm glad I understand pain, because she was not herself the first week. She threw up on oxycodone, wouldn't even take an aspirin. And so the next day I'm taking the bandage off where the surgery was, it was, it was easy surgery, it was just the laminectomies on four, but that's still very painful. And she's swearing at me. I have never heard this lady swear. And I knew, don't take it personal, because it's not her. And I waited about a week till she got better, and then I went out to get her a get well card. And I cracked up with this one, but I waited another week before I gave it to her. So here it is, chronic pain that went away. Well, it was a chronic deep pain that went away. And the card was, I love you more today than yesterday. Because yesterday you were a bitch. <laughs> and she says, what's that all about? And I had explained chronic pain to her. <laughs> 75% of the people with TMJ dysfunction have signs that suggest sleep, dis -breathing, uh, sleep uh, breathing disorders. 75% of them have it. What are the dental implications if you're doing dentistry and a pe person is having a sleep health? <coughs> Compliance with a CPAP for OSA may not be accurately discussed. The patient doesn't know what you're thinking about it. OSA related to hypertension raises concern regarding what medicine do you use? You don't want to raise their blood pressure if you're using epinephrine. Patients with CPAP that are intolerant because of claustrophobia might really be a little bit upset by you draping them. Oral surgery or periodontal surgery procedures may preclude the patient from wearing their CPAP for a while, and you've got to let them know that, or at least inform their physician of that. You probably don't have to do that, but what happens if you the law, you know, what happens if somebody gets sued? Well, I did my duty. You need to protect yourself that way. Patients using a CPAP may have dorsal nasal excoriation, a rash, and then you can't put the nitrous oxide on them for a while. Researchers have documented occlusal changes. Well, of course, we all know that. But you should inform them, as everybody else has been saying already, 
you should inform them of it ahead of time. And one thing with Kent Smith said, I totally agree with him, but I have my own way of saying it. I tell my patients, you might get some crooked teeth out of this. So here's your choice. Would you like to have a beautiful smile, everything just really nice as you lay in the coffin, or would you rather live to be 90 with crooked teeth? And it makes it easy for them to understand just in case they get crooked teeth. Patients may be CPAP intolerant. I did that one already. Calcified arthromas are likely to appear more often on panoramic views. So if you're looking, look beyond the teeth. If you see uh, Eagle syndrome or things of that nature, they show on a panorex. And pa patients with OSA may develop neurocognitive deficiencies, making informed consent difficult. So if you're trying to explain something to them and they're kind of groggy because they have a sleep problem and they don't understand what you're saying, that could be your problem too, unfortunately. Dr. Thomas Nyland, sleep disturbances and depression may become self-sustaining. It's a vicious cycle when you deal with pain. Therefore, identification and management of sleep dis disturbances as well as their psychiatric correlates may be of value in your overall management if you're treating pain. The Journal of Pain and Symptom Management said pain duration and intensity were correlated with decreased sleep. So sleep and pain, they're like brother and sister. You know, they can get along or sometimes they fight, but they're related, that's for sure. Bruxism and OSA. Now, sleep uh, bruxism, 60% of the people in the world when they sleep, men or, men or women, whatever, whatever country you're from, whatever religion or race you are, 60% of the people either clench or grind at night. Now, is that helped by a CPAP? It's not been demonstrated that treating OSA eliminates re or reduces bruxism with a CPAP. <coughs> There's no known cure for sleep uh, bruxism. The goals are management, prevent problems. It's been shown that the CPAP elimination of OSA eliminates snoring, but it has not been demonstrated that it stops grinding your teeth at night. Sleep bruxism is mainly associated with rhythmic masticatory muscle activity caused by repetitive jaw muscle contractions. And it's totally different than when you're chewing because it's repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. When you're chewing, it changes with the intensity and what you're chewing. And it becomes a problem if you grind your teeth to the point where you saw some of those other slides of mine and other people's. So if you think you're sticking something in the mouth just to treat bruxism, you get another thing coming. Anything you stick, any time you stick anything in the mouth, you risk altering the airway. You recognize that man's name. He's been huge in the dental community for many, many years. And that statement was made a while ago, and now we're starting to read his statements. Now, the power of communication, the psychology of words and language revealed. When it comes to language and communication, the rule is it's not what you say, but what people hear. So words are one of the most powerful tools that we as humans possess. They can ignite revolutions or diffuse tension. And we're seeing a lot of that politically in America today, that's for sure. So the reason I bring this up is whether you're treating OSA or TMD, just because you know it, you've got to present it the way your patient understands it so that they follow what you want them to. But just because they do it, what's the impact on them? The impact should be that they trust you and they believe you, but they follow your advice. So if you just tell them, do this, do this, do this, do this, and they hear part of it and they don't remember some of it, maybe they won't get better. So it's communication. Whether it's OSA or TMD, there's a lot to be said for communication. I've got a problem with this slide. It works last night. It worked on my power, but for some reason it isn't here, so I'll just act it out for you. This, this man here is begging. And there's people walking by, throwing down quarters or pennies or nickels, and people walk by, and every once in a while he, they drop something down, he puts his hand up, thank you. And then a lady comes by, and she stops in front of him, and she's not dropping anything. So he puts his hands out, and he touches her shoes, and he recognizes her shoes, and she walks away. And then the same thing happens. Every 10, 20 people 
go by, one person drops something, and then she comes walking by again. And she picks up his sign, which says, I'm blind, please help. She turns it around and she writes something. She puts it down. And then people are walking by and almost everybody's throwing money, throwing money, throwing money. And she walks by again. And he feels her shoes and he says, what did you do to my sign? And she said, I just told your story but in different words. And it says on the sign, it's a beautiful day today, but I can't see it. That's powerful. And the way you present things to your patients is more powerful sometimes than what you're doing for your patients. So I rushed through this because I want to, I want to see Nick talk. And he's scheduled at 2 o'clock. So. Uh, the absolute and most superior and effective way to learn and truly learn TMD and OSA, start as you are today with taking classes. This is a great start. But to enhance that basic knowledge, get involved. The ASBA is loaded with minds right there in front of us and some people who will be here next year. And they're all, we're all willing to share. Volunteer for committees, which the ASBA intends to utilize as we change the face of OSA. Great minds think alike, and in this room, there are those minds brainstorming during these committees. We learn from each other as we're talking. So instead of having just a few of us do everything, what I'd like you to do is, if you think you want to be on a committee and you have some heart that you want to just get rid of some things and learn some things and help the world, that's what we're going to try to do here. ASBA wants to change the world of sleep medicine, and we're doing a really good job, but it's only been four years. Uh, so if you think you want to help out, there's my email address, tmjsleepdoctor at yahoo.com. And I think old school and good school, and well, current school, it's all good, should go, come together. I learned this um, from a friend of mine. I was going with Rick Bonato, where he has a, a class every year. And Rick is a great um, connoisseur of wine. So he, he has everybody get together and talk all day long for two days in Niagara Falls and then takes us to different wineries. And we have six different wines and six, six different pairings of food. It's so much fun. And I told that to a friend of mine. And he told me the history of the word symposium, which is up there. And that's what Plato did. He got a bunch of people together. And they drank wine all day and solved problems. So thank you. I, rush through it because I d didn't have a whole hour and uh, I probably have time for a few questions before the next speaker. <laughs>